Okay. I'm not sure why the camera... Okay, here we go. All right, hi, guys. I'm um, sorry I wasn't in class today. I had to be out on Friday. Um, hopefully, um, you enjoyed the Founding Brothers video. All right, right here. Good stuff. And you got some of uh, Chapter 6, Section 3 read. Um, we're going to kind of combine Chapter 6, Sections 2 and 3 into a couple of videos. So if you look at your calendar, you see there's a Part 1 tonight or over the weekend, depending on when you watch this. And then there will be a Part 2 on, let's see, I'm pointing at my calendar, on uh, Tuesday night, October 9th, because you don't have school on Monday. You nice three-day weekend. So if you look at this image, or the two images, you get these mo moving vans out in front of the White House. You know, it's a moving day. And just think about it. When does a president move out of the White House? Right, when they're done. When they're done, whether it's at the end of one term, which I suppose President Obama is hoping that's not the case this year, or, or it's at the end of two terms when they are um, they're finished serving their time as President of the United States. It's moving day. And this is, you know, it's, I'm sure there's some, some sadness in a president, for a president. I'm sure they're also, you know, kind of happy. Obviously, there's another guy who's going to, there's going to be another moving van coming right behind this one to move stuff in. And that guy is probably on top of the world, but has a, you know, a lot of expectations and promises that they just made. And what I want you to think about is, you know, if we think of, you know, the, um, I'm pointing as if you can see where I'm pointing, but the, the top one up here, he's moving out and then this guy comes in and he's moving in. That's, that's a transition in power. It's a significant transition in power from one president to the next. It might even be from, you know, one political party to the next. Like if Mitt Romney were to beat President Obama in November, come January 20th when he was inaugurated, we would not only have a shift in power from one man to another, but it would go from one political party to another, from one philosophy to another. This is unique. You know, here, here's, here's a couple of other images of transfers of power. You know, this, this is the more likely event in, in the history of the world is, you know, if you want to take somebody's power, you've got to get rid of them. Literally, you've got to get rid of them. You've got kings who have been executed. You've got governments that were toppled and overthrown. I'm thinking about the Russian Revolution and, you know, Tsar Nicholas and his entire family killed so that the, the power could be transitioned to the people. Um, you know, this looks a lot better. So what I want us to accomplish today, and we're, we're going to get through half of this today and half of tomorrow. So we're going to we're going to hopefully go through the you know, the Washington to Adams portion first, and then on Monday night get to the Adams to Jefferson portion. And we're talking about you know to, I want you to identify with the struggle with the um, the struggle with the earliest transition transitions in power in the United States. It's a unique transfer of power. You know, it's 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 a public election. It's a democratic process. And then in the end, everybody just has to accept how it worked out. Everybody has to accept that it's it's okay. And so if we you know, think of where we've been, you know, we know that there are political differences. And, and this is something that was highlighted in the video that you watched today. We know there are political differences. Guys that used to be friends because they were on the same page with the revolution are now political enemies because they have very different beliefs about where the country's going. You know, Hamilton and Jefferson are the best example of this. And the two issues that we, you, you looked at in class um, for the last couple of days when you did the Discovering Hamilton exercise and then also the video on Friday, you know, the assumption of state debt, the increasing of the national debt, how that leads to excise taxes, things like the Whiskey Rebellion, and then the Bank of the United States and how that was a, you know, a, a, a pivotal constitutional issue where you, you can't do it according to Jefferson and you can't not do it according to Hamilton. There is, and it's revealed in this first transition in power, there is a bit of a constitutional glitch in how they called for presidents to be elected. Um, if we look at the first contested presidential election, which happens in 1796, so this will be the first one that George Washington is not a, not a part of, um, the winner was John Adams. John Adams won the election. Fair and square, you know, the electoral votes came in and he, he won the election. <clears throat> well, second place became vice president. Now, I don't mean second place like you know how Mitt Romney picked Paul Ryan or Barack Obama picked Joe Biden. You know, this would be like President Obama were to win the election and his vice president would be Mitt Romney because Romney finished in second place. Obviously, this is, you know, th this would be difficult to get things done for the president if his second man, if his vice president was somebody who disagreed with him on everything. And this is the situation we're going to be in. Um, from the beginning of his presidency, Adams, Adams faced... Uh, you know, a lot of problems, specifically based on his legitimacy for office. 
you know, he's not Washington. Imagine following Washington. He's following the president. He's following a legend. And he, you know, he almost doomed to failure, whoever followed him. And, and Adams has the unfortunate um, place in history of being that guy. So if we look at the political parties that existed at the time, we know that there were the Friends of Hamilton. And we're going to call them Federalists. They call themselves Federalists. President Adams was a Federalist. However, something that's really important for you to remember is that he is not the most powerful Federalist. He's not the most influential Federalist. Alexander Hamilton was the most influential Federalist. And he's the President of the United States, Adams. And he's got this other guy, Hamilton, who's much more influential, much more powerful than him, within his own party. The Friends of Jefferson will start to call the Democratic Republicans, although they'll just kind of call themselves the Republicans. So if you see Republicans, they're talking about Jefferson's friends, Jefferson's parties. So what's the main difference between these two political parties? If you think about all those, the T-chart that we went through, and if you haven't watched that video, I say you go back and watch that. That one is most significant. Um, take some time this weekend and go back and do that, because having those T-chart notes would be very helpful for you. Um, the most significant difference is their view on power of government and the Constitution. Strict interpretation for the Democratic Republicans. You know, the National Bank was illegal because nowhere in the Constitution did it say that you could create a National Bank. If you wanted to be able to do that, you needed to create a constitutional amendment. Versus loose interpretation or loose construction of the Federalists, where they say, you know, the Constitution has to grow with us over time. And if in five years we need a National Bank, then we create a National Bank because it says in the Constitution that we can do the things that are necessary and proper. That's the main difference. When we have a President Adams and his Vice President Jefferson, we have, you know, we have very different people. We have very different philosophies. And the President and Vice President were old friends from the Revolution, but now they are political enemies. And hopefully you read in your book about this whole thing about France and impressment. And I'm going to encourage you to go back and look at your reading notes and look at things like you know, the XYZ affair, to look at the Quasi War with France. You know, we were, we were very unhappy with the way the world was treating us. And when the country almost goes to war with France, the Federalists decide, consistent with their philosophy, to increase the strength of government by passing a couple of laws that would limit people's ability to speak against their government, that would limit newspapers' rights to print articles that were critical of the government, specifically critical of their anti-France uh, stance. So the question is, you know, how far can the government go to protect itself from radicals or what they view as radicals? Because people like Jefferson and Jefferson's friends thought, you know, France should be our friend. You know, they went through a revolution just like we did. They're our brothers in revolution. Those are the people who we should be closest with. And we were nearly going to war with them because the Federalists were pushing for a conflict with France because we thought we could compete with them. They passed these laws, the Alien and Sedition Acts. And in those Alien and Sedition Acts, it made it essentially illegal to, to talk badly about your government, to criticize your government, to write editorials that were critical of your government. And in response, Thomas Jefferson is going to write, and this is going to be our last slide, and this is where we're going to leave off before we make the next transition. Thomas Jefferson is going to write something called the Kentucky Resolution. And what it does is it puts at the center the Constitution. And what he says is that the Constitution is a contract, or it should be viewed as a contract, and that each of the independent or individual states agreed, when they ratified it, they agreed to the contract. So what, what he's saying is there are specific terms, like in any contract, if a contract says that I, had to, I have to work till 3 o'clock, you can't make me work till 3.30. Thomas Jefferson was saying if a contract says you know A, B, and C, you, you can only do A, B, and C. You can't do D, E, and F just because you want to. And so he says in the Kentucky Resolution that the, that the Union, right, the United States, is a contract. And each of the states agreed to that contract. No state can be made to accept any law that goes beyond the scope of the contract. That is, if the government violates the contract by creating a law that is illegal, the state, the individual state, had the right to, and this is the term that you need to know, they had the right to nullify, to declare void that law. And so 
this is going to create a very difficult transition in power during the Adams presidency because it's going to create, he has an international crisis with France, and now he begins to have this domestic crisis at home with the Democratic Republicans, and most specifically, his own vice president. And it all leads up perfectly into another presidential election in 1800, where the candidates are going to be the same. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, only a couple of things are going to happen, and we'll look at this in class on Tuesday, a couple of things are going to happen that add some flavor to the election of 1800. So the big things that I think that you should take out of this presentation are the, the idea of the central issue between Democratic Republicans and Federalists, how the transition in power leaves a weaker president like Adams compared to Washington vulnerable to the, the attacks of the opposition party. Jefferson would have never gone after Washington this way, but he feels comfortable going after Adams. And then we have to figure out on Monday, I'm sorry, on Tuesday, and into the present presentation on Tuesday, how does Hamilton fit into all this? Where is he? What's he doing? And how is he using his power? So we'll pick up with all that on Tuesday.